Hi, I'm Stephen Galpin and welcome to our new series of Focus Programs here on Property TV. Today we're going to be shining the spotlight on property taxation and accounting. There is no doubt that since suffering the COVID pandemic and walking straight into a cost of living crisis, the property market could well be heading for turbulent times. So, as the myriad of experts appearing on our shows tell us, forward planning and the need to take expert advice has never been more important, whether you're an established business or simply starting out on a new career in the industry. To help us have an understanding of this most complex and critical subject, I'm pleased to welcome to the studio Z Razak, MD of Surtax Accounting Limited. Z, welcome. Thanks, Stephen, and thank you for the intro. I'm really looking forward to us getting to the nuts and bolts on all of this. Okay, well, try and keep it simple because I have a fairly simple mind. Um, <laughs> so I, I think what I'd like to start off with, um, Z, is this business of uh, uh, property investment, as I say, whether you're established business or whether you're new, um, we're always being told that it's very important to plan. And plan means plan your entry and also plan your exit as well. Both yeah. as equally as important. And this, I guess, um, although you may be going to put me right here, I think it starts off with the structure of what you're creating. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> I actually split into three areas. One on the acquisition uh, and the structuring. Number two, on the actual journey through whether you're doing property development or investing the lifetime with the company. And number three, exit. Mm. And I know we're going to get into all different details. So if we start with the number one, the acquisition, depending on what you're acquiring, um, the structures can change and the advice can change. So three key areas when you're acquiring property. First, you have to decide whether it's commercial or residential you're acquiring sure, sure. Uh, and what type of residential you can acquire as well. So this will change the answer. Um, and then you can then uh, take advantage of stamp duty land tax, uh, SDLT quite hefty these days. Number two, you've got to think about is VAT if you're buying commercial property. Let's use that example. And number three, the area that a lot of people forget the legendary capital allowances. Mm. So if you think about those three on acquisition of a commercial property, very important to get your uh, property tax specialist involved in that. Mm. Then, depending on the answer to those, then you structure which entity you're going to put them in. Yeah. Well, do, I mean, do you find as a rule that um, it's easier for a new investor to go into residential property rather than commercial? Is it less fraught? Really good question. It depends on your knowledge. Right. For me, I think, uh, and we're going to touch on how the government making it a bit difficult. Mm. It's all about investment in knowledge. If you invest in knowledge and you actually understand the subject area, then you can make a better informed decision. I think the people that struggle are the ones that haven't invo invested in knowledge. Yeah. OK. I, I, I mean, the, the reason I ask that question is because mm. I can see from the legislation that's been um, put through in the last two or three years, the government, government are making it more difficult for the private investor with one or two or three residential properties to, to get into the market, to be tax effective, to be, yeah. to be useful in that area. I mean, when, when all this started, I suppose, with Margaret Thatcher days of investing in property and start your own business and all this it, it, it also helped to solve the, the the housing shortage but now the government almost seem to be discouraging the smaller investor now if i want to be cynical i could say that well i suppose collecting tax from a limited company or an incorporated body is going to be a lot easier than chasing around a lot of individual landlords who may or not be declaring their tax on on rents properly i suppose I think our tax code is quite complicated and I think you mentioned that. I think one of the key things is invest in knowledge. So the person that hasn't got knowledge, they're looking at it and making the wrong decision. So let's use one of your examples. Uh, good old George Osborne, if he's watching, uh, you've introduced a few pieces of legislation which has affected people. And one of them is tax on interest, mm. landlord tax, technical word section 24 of the Finance Act. And the reason why that is a bit of a problem is it's changed how you get relief on mortgages mm -hmm. uh, and the interest. That wasn't the case before, and now it's fully in play. So mm -hmm. if you invest in your own name, depending on your financial situation, i.e. what incomes you're earning, you're gonna have a problem because you're gonna end up having a difference between uh, the actual profit that you're paying tax and the cash flow. Mm -hmm. That's what he's done. So mm -hmm. you've got to be very careful. So you've made a really good point around how many properties. If, you're, if you've got more than one or two properties in your own name, depending on your income, if you're working on a job and things like this, it's highly likely 
that you're a bit knackered, let's mm. be honest. Mm. So it's probably not a good place to start. Mm. And you may have uh, getting the advice around which structure yes. is so key in this. Yes. I think I, I think one of one of the issues that I have with this whole investment mm. structure is that um, it's it, it's no good trying to encourage people to go into business if they're not business minded. If you're going to go in and be a, a, an effective landlord, there are going to be days and times when you have to make unpleasant decisions. Maybe it's the eviction of somebody, maybe it's the refusal to do this or that to the property that's unreasonable or, or all these kind of things. You've got to be prepared to make tough decisions. And if you're not of that frame of mind, it's probably not a wonderful idea to go into property investment because this, this ethos that we've had in this country for a long time, buy a property and you're going to make money, just doesn't work anymore. I think it's a challenge and it goes back to having the right people around mm. you. Um, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs in trading businesses and in property investment businesses and in property development businesses. The mindset is key, but it's the people that get good advice uh, that can make a big difference. Yes. Um, and their mindset will be different because no one knows everything. So you, sometimes you don't know what it's going to entail yes. um, until you get into it. But if you know up front and I get insight, it's going to make a better decision. But I still, I'm still in the school of thought. I think property investment uh, and doing it properly or property development is still one of our biggest asset classes to invest. Well, it, it, it certainly is. And we're very fortunate to live in a country where our real estate regulations, laws and legislation is probably some of the best in the world. You invest in property here and it's safe. You know, I've, I've worked in countries where, you know, you can buy a property, you can have all the paperwork you like, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be owning it for very long, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I think we are fortunate in that respect. I, I think, Stephen, you raised a really good point. Uh, I think the risk, because I remember having a conversation with, uh, when I worked in industry with uh, a senior member, and I said, you can invest in the subcontinent, because even though I'm born in my family or somewhere else, and the person looked at me and he gave me a lesson and I remember this lesson. He said, yeah, you may get higher returns, but have you weighed in the risk? Mm. Is that property still going to be there in five, yeah, 10 years? Exactly. Uh, so you raised a really important point. Yeah, you have mm. to weigh the risk with the return. OK, just to finally close down this, this business of, of what structure to use. Mm. I mean, as a general idea, I mean, I get the impression you're saying for commercial property, there are so many angles to yeah. it in terms of taxation and structure. A, a company really is the only way forward with that, isn't it? To try and do that in your own personal name is not terribly practical, is it? I, I think really important where I mentioned the where well, you've got to get a bit of evaluation from a, your property tax specialist. And the mm. reason being is if you buy commercial property, because like in the studio here, it's an office, right? It's, that's a commercial property. It's got different rules. Mm. So therefore, you may not want to put it in a limited company. You may put it in an LP right. because you can okay. earn because limited companies have double taxation. But it is a formal structure rather yeah. than just a... I, I would always have that because if you don't have something that's going to limit your liabilities, that's why I, I would always look at LLPs and limited companies yeah. Yeah. because then you're limiting your liability and you risk. Yeah. And I think that is always very important, especially property. Yeah. Um, I, I think you raised a really good point is there's, depending on what your long-term strategy, commercial will be one uh, strategy residential um, sort of break it down into four ideas if you don't mind me just mention them sure. four things you have your traditional buy to let which is like long-term lets then you've got hmos which is household or multiple can see when you rent out by the room yeah. then you've got furnished holiday lets and service accommodation i know there's others but those are the four common mm. the decision changes depending on what you're doing okay. so buy to lets commonly we will put in limited companies because the tax on interest right mm. that doesn't apply in limited companies mm. so people normally now the conventional ways to buy in limited companies. You can weigh up depending how big you want to scale it. Um, same with probably HMOs as well. But the other two is a different bit because HMRC treat them as like uh, trading businesses mm. in, in the sense um, for a capital gains tax, uh, which is a quite a big area that you need to factor in on your exit. Okay. Well, one, one, um, once again, I mean, you raised the point there. Very important, not only just to work out your entry strategy yeah. but your exit strategy in other words where you want to be in five years or ten years and whether that's a long-term investment just for income or whether you're mm. actually i suppose looking for the capital gain yeah and i think the other big point huge point is legacy uh, i know we'll talk about it is because there's a difference when you're doing property because it and we'll touch on this when we're doing the differentiation between property development and property investment okay. but the inheritance tax rules 
also change uh, depending on what you're doing. And this is why it's so important to see a seeker specialist in that area to get that advice because that could be a huge difference maker. Mm. IHT inheritance tax is 40%. Yeah. That's massive. Been an expensive mistake, wouldn't it? <laughs> and you'll be surprised, Stephen, how many people I find uh, I meet who haven't had that advice or uh, gone to a generalist mm. um, and they just thought, I'll just get my accounts done. How, how complex is it? I mean, for instance, if you were to start off on your own with two or mm. three properties and you end up having four, five, six properties, it, is there an optimum point where you would change over to be in a limited company? I, I mean, does that often happen? Really good point. Fantastic about incorporations. Yes, that's happening a lot because of the tax on interest. It's making a lot of landlords sell up because they're not making no money. No. So people are moving between their names into a limited company and we help them with the incorporation. The question you're asking, what point that incorporation? Uh, that depends on the scenario. So you can't just put it down to number of properties. We have to illustrate hours. Uh, people probably hear about it. it's a famous case called Ramsey that deals with this mm. and that's given uh, the precedent on it and what you have to think about is can you show 20 hours pretty much in that business so if it's like five to ten buy to lets good chance mm. but if you've got two or three unlikely mm. however if you've got two three HMOs with loads of tenants it yeah. changes the answer. Yeah. So you have to have your evaluation done. Simply, simply because HMOs take a lot more management than a single buy to let, obviously. A yeah. Absolutely. And I think mm. that's the key difference. And if you do that, a lot of people we've worked with have incorporated. And there's huge benefits of incorporation. Okay. Huge. And just, just to draw this half of the show to a yeah. close, um, there's a relatively new category of investment that's, that's getting quite popular now, especially in London, yeah. which is co-living. Yeah. Where, where, where does that fit within the, the categories? Really good question we were talking about off here. It's got a lot of stuff that's going through at the moment because the government are sort of deciding what it falls under. Is it more like service accommodation, which has really good tax provisions, um, whereas uh, tax incentives, whereas uh, when you buy a buy to let, it's not really got that many tax incentives. Mm. So the key question that we, we would look at the answer is whether it qualifies for co-living. Does it meet the criteria? If it does, and it's considered short-term tenancy, there's a good point around service accommodation aspects, very similar, yeah. and therefore you can claim capital Well, analysis. the interesting thing is on co-living, apparently the stats are saying that mm. the average, uh, average length of tenancy is about 18 months now rather than being a very short term. Yeah, I think you need to really look into that and look mm. at some of the circumstances. A lot of value comes looking at individual circumstances okay. and making sure they meet that right criteria. Because what people don't realise, and we use service accommodation as a good example, is that when you start having lets more than, say, 30 days, uh, the rules change uh, because they're not considered short term lets anymore. All right. Yeah, and yeah. also there's a VAT implication to that. So it sort of knocks onto your business. So you need to evaluate your business, your strategy, talk to the right people. We'll come on to VAT later. Well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking Z more questions and having more explanations, I'm sure. Hello, and welcome back to part two uh, with see Razak giving us good advice on the tax situation related to property investments. Um, Z, we, we've talked about the various structures that you can utilize to make your investment, whether you're starting off or whether you're converting what you've already got. Um, what I'd like to know, um, I, I, I've mentioned to you that, I mean, the government are being tighter and tighter on the smaller investor. Is there an optimum point, i.e. number of properties or value of investment, that it, your accountant would or your advisor would say, no, nah, it's time to change now. It's time to move up a gear and make the investment a little bit more sophisticated. I think that's the simplest way of putting it. Yeah, I, I look at it a slightly different way. I think that conversation at the beginning, what they want to achieve, because we don't start them in a journey which is going to fall over. And that's what happens with a lot of property investors. They start and they're like, um, we don't actually know, so we'll buy it in our own name. And then they get into the predicament, they bought one or two properties, mm. and it's like, oh, I'm in that halfway house. Mm. So if they had the advice and said, I'm only ever going to have one or two, 
right? So then we could have given them that right advice, probably in your own name, still could work, depending yeah. on your job and how much employment income and is your wife on there if you're married mm. and all these aspects. Do you need a partnership, LLP or normal partnership? Mm. That could be one solution. But if they then say to me, look, I'm going to scale this. This is my future. I want to mm. move from this mm. into that. Then you've got to give them different advice. And you also got to structure the company in a certain way that helps them, especially if they've got children, not get hit by what I said in the first part, the dreaded inheritance tax, 40%. And it can be minimized if done properly. It's harder when you start the journey than at the beginning. Okay. Now, moving on to something that we just touched on in, yeah. in the first half, which is VAT. Yeah, um, love it. Now, my simple understanding is that VAT doesn't apply to residential properties. Does, does that apply to the investment side of that as well as the <laughs> really good point? Uh, and Stephen, you raise a point. The default position is that. However, if I've got a furnished holiday let business or a service accommodation and I clear 85,000, it's considered a trading business, then VAT is chargeable. Okay. Um, and this can be quite painful if you haven't planned it because it's 20%. Yeah. There's even a special type of VAT. Uh, and would that be retrospective if you had made a mistake? <laughs> um, yeah, because HMRC, one people that you do not mess about and we touched on or is our friends in the VAT office they have a lot of power so it's very good point to make sure you're compliant mm. on that mm. and take advantage of it yeah. uh, within the rules I mean it's very easy isn't it to read the press and say oh no residential's VAT free and all the rest <laughs> of it but as, as you correctly mentioned there are so many different facets of even residential investment whether it's <laughs> short lets holiday lets serviced accommodation or, or, or whatever so yeah good point again um I don't know how many of our programs you watch, but I can tell yeah. you sort of almost ad nauseum, our, our experts will always say, get expert advice before you start, before you make those decisions, because, you know, the mistakes are so expensive these days, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think in what we call it a strategic property consultation, a lot of property experts will do that because what they will do is they understand your position first understand your overall position what your goals and objectives are get that advice get the structure because it will pay 10 times over if not more you know some clients uh, in my field a lot of people because the assets are worth so much they can change save you hundreds of thousands if not millions which is quite big and if you think about that is it worth the investment yeah. the ROI the return investment is quite huge okay now um if we look at um, just briefly at, at property development, okay. Now, I, I think I, I well, I, I say I think I ran foul of it because I, 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 I have to confess I didn't really understand it at the time, and I'm not sure I do now. But <clears throat> developing a small riverside property, um, and we had a, a, a huge battle with inland revenue over the classification i wasn't it was it an investment company that was doing it or was it a development i.e i suppose trading company that, that that was doing it and i'd like to understand what what the real practical difference is between those two entities that is an amazing question and i have this asked so many times and uh, unless you've got insight property you probably won't know the and answer. i also need to know what's the consequence of <laughs> uh, <laughs> huge consequences <clears throat> So I'll explain it in probably hopefully in simple terms and the audience uh, sort of understand this. If you have a property development, i.e. you're refurbing, uh, or sorry, elevating uh, the property by adding value to it, um, it's considered stock. And you'd be like, what the hell? It's a trading business, okay. right? That's the simple. When it's a property investment, it goes as an investment. And what the purpose of a property investment is to secure rent as a return. Whereas a property development purpose is you do the build or conversion or whatever exercise you're doing or you're adding a floor and then you sell it, right? Mm -hmm. The impacts getting this wrong and um, flip-flopping between the two is your intentions have to be really clear. Because if you get it wrong, what will happen is that if you said I was a developer and I'm doing this and we classified it as stock and then we suddenly said, oh, it's, we're now an investor, you, you get something called a dry tax charge and there's no way of deferring it just by changing the uh, classification. I've seen this a lot and that's quite scary because you've not even sold the property yet and mm. you've already got a no tax capital. Yeah, yeah. Be, again, if it's in a company, it'd be subject to corporation tax. So that's one of the consequences. The other bit is, if you're really wise and you did it and you are a property developer, your exit strategy is different mm. because you can then, provided you meet the conditions, claim entrepreneurial leaf, which is massive. 
You know, that could save you 100 grand. If it's a husband and wife, that's 200 grand in your pocket of tax savings, massive. You may even claim investor's relief, which is where you get people investing finance, and we'll talk about leverage, and that's one of the ways. And the other one is, you can go again. You just obviously pay corporation tax. You can mitigate it with the right ideas. Um, but then you can put money, if you think about group structures, you can only do that for limited companies. Mm -hmm. So you can move the cash around. So knowing that definition and getting the right advice is huge. If you are now an investor, right, unlike a developer where you get something called business property relief, uh, which means that you don't have to pay inheritance tax, okay. which is massive, a property investor, you don't get those exits. You don't get the um, inheritance tax uh, benefit of the BPR. You have to pay uh, inheritance tax. So you have to structure the company differently. And we call them family investment companies. They're called loads of different names. But you've got to do that because otherwise, as the value increases, you've got a bigger problem to deal with. I hope I've given, because it is a complex question. I've tried to break it down. It, it, it is a complex question. But, but again, doesn't it just come down to this business to be very clear about what your, your entry strategy is? Because if you don't, I mean, your, your, your exit is going to be driven by taxation rather than the right thing to do for you. Yeah, and also I think flexibility. There mm. is flexibility mm. in our tax code. So imagine I did a developing property, I developed it, and I can't sell it, and I've had to rent it out. There is case law to protect you to say your intentions are still to sell it, yeah. but this is temporary yeah. and you can do this. The biggest bit people worry about is VAT, right? Yes. When they change, if they, yeah. if they keep their stock, because if you've claimed back VAT and you just built a new house, uh, a part of your portfolio and things like this, you don't want to have any VAT clawbacks. Yeah. Because certain costs, even building a new build, have more than zero rated VAT. I think the problem that I encountered at the time was, was that we bought the site. Mm. Uh, we had so much trouble with the planning consent because it was Riverside. So we were, so I, I think, arguing with you know, the environment agency for a year about you know, water storage and all the rest of it. And they, they were worried that the fish would be dazzled by the amount of light coming from all these glass panels. I mean, it was just quite unbelievable. My architect actually at the time did another CGI with a little fish popping out of the water with sunglasses on. But, you know, um, <laughs> it was quite funny. We did let the planners see wow. it. So, so they, they found it quite amusing. But um, the, the thing was that the, the because of the length of time of planning, which we, we, we couldn't put off the purchase of the mm -hmm. site to wait for that, so we had to, had to own it. But the length of time between actually getting down to construction and then the projected um, construction time, because it was quite a complex uh, structure, was so long that revenue started to say, that, you know, this isn't development, you're, you're, you're just bought the site for investment here, hoping it'll gain and, you know, this sort of thing. And we had quite a protracted argument about that. Yeah. I, I think this is where a good uh, accountant, tax advisor, specialised area can come to your rescue. Mm. Because if they clearly articulate the, uh, it's the intentions mm. is to develop and sell, mm. and you illustrate that with good board minutes covering that, yeah. you're putting yourself in a good position because it will help with your exit strategy, which sure. I mentioned earlier. Um, mm. And it also will keep uh, a lot of pain away. So property development does have benefits. The, the challenge people have is when they change or they really want to hold the property. Or suddenly decide, I like this, I'm going to keep it, yes. <laughs> Which is where I nearly got to. <laughs> and that's the bit where you've got to be really careful on how you do that because um, you'll have a number of issues. And that's why we, we have something called group structures, mm. right? So you have subsidiary A, a parent company, subsidiary B. If you understand and they don't necessarily all have to have the same purpose, presumably. Potentially. Um, you've got to be careful because what HMRC have caught on to uh, some of the benefits where people used to have something like a trading business and then have property investment business. Mm. Now they look at what the whole structure is. There's a case on this, unfortunately. Right. So you okay. can't look at just revenue. You've got to look at the balance sheet. And all, everyone knows property is quite expensive, right? So you've got to think about the longer term strategy around it and you can minimize it if you do it wisely. Okay. Well, the next subject that we want to move on to is the um, perception or, or fact that you can't put residential property into a pension fund. But there are, I understand, ways of utilising residential property as a pension. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I think that's one of the best questions and uh, I've done quite a few um, 
videos and things on this stuff and it's quite a complex area but generally what people use is um, if you want to get to financial freedom that's the real question of property and what your long-term aspirations are you want multiple sources of income one of them must be because it's the biggest privilege of being running a limited company in the uk is a SAS pension a small self-administered scheme. That's what the SAS stands. Okay. And you can take 12 million outside tax. And the reason why I suggest this to answer your question is that when you've got that pension, what you can do, which you can't do with any other pension, is do a loan to a SPV, a right. special purse fee, yep. fancy name for a limited company that holds property. Okay. You do a loan up to 50% of that value. So therefore, you're managing it without having headaches so you can still use the money it's a different way of using the money right uh, and therefore you can build outside the pension in your limited company as well as within it and the beauty one plus point on this even the beauty is you can charge interest to yourself because therefore you're saving corporation tax in the company it's going into a SAS pension and the four major taxes are avoided there's no income tax no SAS pension no corporation tax no capital gains tax, and the big one, no inheritance tax. Would that, would that in any way impact uh, negatively on any funding opportunities? Not really, because you are the funder, no, because you're I, becoming the bank. Okay, so, yeah, but then you've got to get the bank to go into your... Yeah, absolutely. Do, do, do you follow? Yeah, so I think the biggest challenge is when you do a loan from a pension, they normally want to be joint first charge, okay. right? So you do need to look at, how you invest. And a lot of people, how they use these tools is they get uh, investor finance in okay. as well. So you could use that money and the tenure of the pension loan is lower than a normal uh, residential mortgage. It tends to be over five years. So you've got to be really clear on what you're doing, how okay. you're doing it. So that's a very good point, definitely. Right, okay. So there are opportunities. Oh, there's all, it, it's kind of, <laughs> Stephen, as we discussed and we had a good chat before this, there's it's so much about who you talk to and that passion. Everyone always talks and says to me, accountancy tax is boring. I disagree because I don't think it is. I think it's quite a sexy side and well, I say I think, this. I think after this morning, I'm going to disagree <laughs> because I found, I found what you've been saying absolutely riveting. It's great, it's great stuff. Um, look, finally, can we, can we just discuss broadly mm. the most effective ways of exiting uh, the various situations, either as a sole trader or a limited company or an LLP? Mm. Um, is it greatly different between an investment uh, 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 body and a holding body, I suppose? So if you, if, if you bought your buy to let with actually more emphasis on hoping for a capital gain, yeah, you know, is, is that exit different from selling on the investment of half a dozen buy to let properties, for instance? This is one of the most common questions, uh, and it's not a straightforward one, but I'll try my best to put okay. it in simple terms. But you've got if about you, two minutes. <laughs> I love it. In, in your own name, you're looking at uh, the implications, right, from an income tax perspective and potentially a capital gains tax perspective, right? You get an annual exemption, you and your potential wife will get of oh, 12 grand, 12,300 is at the moment, they've frozen it, each. So you get an uh, exemption against the capital gain. So that's one of the benefits. But the problem is, is income tax. That's mm -hmm. the problem because you don't get the finance, full finance relief anymore. So when you put it in the limited company, you get the finance relief, but you don't get this annual exemption. Okay. However, corporation tax at the moment is 19% could change depending who comes leadership. Well, it's either going to 25 or 15, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is a big difference. But whereas in your own name, capital gains tax on residential is 18 and 28%. Right. So you've got to be really careful. So limited company can still be beneficial if you know your longer term plan. Mm. The other big that we mentioned in just the point before is pension contributions. Mm. Limited company, even if I go investment company, tax deductible Okay. in your own name when you've got property, then don't go against the property income. Okay. That's a big difference. Just on the, very finally and very quickly, on the limited company situation, mm -hmm. there used to be an allowance for you to be able, as an entrepreneur, to take your, take your money out at a very low tax rate. I think it was 10%, if I remember rightly. Has all that finished now? Is there any kind of opportunity there? Because if you, if you liquidate everything, you end up with a limited company with loads of cash. And you think, I don't want this. I, I want the cash. It depends on what type of limited company it is. If it's a property investment company, what you're talking about is commonly known as Entrepreneur's Relief. Yes. They have changed the name to Business Asset Disposal Relief. But I still call it Entrepreneur's Relief okay. because everyone knows. You get 10%, but that's only on trading businesses. 
right? So it has to be a property development. It has to meet certain criteria. Two years, you have to do it. You have to have at least 5%, you have to be a director, yeah. and then you can claim this relief. But if you're an investor, you don't get that. Okay. So if you liquidate, then you're going to get hit at whatever uh, the, the, the prevailing tax rates are for you. So very careful uh, planning is required. Um, I wouldn't recommend property investment companies to uh, liquidate if they can avoid it. I would re recommend get the advice structure and pass that legacy on to their loved ones or their beneficiaries. Z, I'm going to say thank you very much for all that wonderful information. I'm sure I shall benefit from it, and I'm sure our viewers will too. So thank you again. Um, Z Razak is Managing Director of Surtax Accounting based in St Albans. And uh, Z, I'll be very happy to see you again on the show. Thank you for having us, and I really appreciate you taking time. Really Great, enjoyed sir. it. Thank you. Thank you.